We could transform agriculture right now. I don't know how many people watching this realize we lose 40% of what is grown on this planet to waste, either not getting it to market, which is usually in the global south, or we throw it away, which is in places like here. We don't have a global food shortage. We're not vaguely close to a global food shortage. We're pounding the ground right now because we're incredibly inefficient with the way we use it. I'm Susan Spurlock, Executive Director of Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's program, Too Hot to Handle Climate Meets Climate Change Meets American Politics, in the fourth program of our six-week spring series, Governing in Crisis, Biden and the Looming Midterms. The newly released United Nations IPCC report tells us we are at the point of no return with climate change and that the situation is worse than we thought. It's easy to see wildfires, epic storms, floods, and droughts worsen each year. Combine that with rising sea levels, loss of species, and the changing weather affecting our growing seasons and the situation looks grim indeed. Upon taking office last year, Joe Biden elevated climate change to one of the top four issues for his administration, along with battling the pandemic, rebuilding the economy, and fighting racism. Yet his most crucial climate proposal is dead in Congress, and the conservative-dominated Supreme Court heard arguments last month in one of the most important environmental cases in more than a decade that could shred Biden's plan to have the nation's greenhouse emissions end by the end of the decade, which scientists have said is necessary to avert the most catastrophic impacts of climate change. The Biden administration is aware of the disappointment with the stalling of their signature climate package. We understand people's frustration, White House National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy said at an event last month. We would all like to be running faster and faster. Yes, and we fully intend to be running faster and faster. Carolyn Beeler, an acclaimed environment correspondent and editor at The World, leads a discussion with our distinguished panel of experts into the science, policy, and politics of the client crisis now, and what actions need to be taken to pull back from the brink. This series is presented by the Suffolk University Department of Political Science and Legal Studies, in collaboration with Ford Hall Forum at Suffolk University, the Washington Center, and GBH Forum Network. I'd also like to recognize the Lowell Institute, whose generous fundings makes programs like this possible. It is now my pleasure to introduce Christina Coolidge, a faculty member in the Political Science and Legal Studies Department at Suffolk University. Christina. Thanks, Susan, and welcome back, everyone, to the fourth, I think, yes, the fourth edition of our episode of our uh, Biden seminar. We are examining, as you know, his major initiatives and asking how far he's gotten in the course of his first year and kind of crystal balling it and looking ahead toward what that means for the upcoming, for the upcoming midterms. Now, Climate gloom and doom is everywhere. The question is, is it really merited? And what can we do about it? So I'm hoping that even though I am a glass half empty person, that our panel will not leave you feeling hopeless. There are a lot of other things that are going on in the world that are, that are difficult to deal with. So without any further ado, I'm going to quickly introduce our panel and then throw it to our moderator for tonight. We have Bradley Campbell, 
with who is the president of the Conservation Law Foundation, Ed Clark, uh, Ed Carr, I'm sorry, from Clark University, who was a lead author on the recent IP, IPCC report. We have Sarah Schwartz, who is a professor at Suffolk University, and Gina Copland Newfield, who is Chief of Staff of the Office of Policy in the US Department of Energy. Carolyn Beerler has already been introduced to you. Some of you probably know her from her work on the world, and I am thrilled to toss it to Carolyn to guide tonight's discussion. Carolyn? Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Susan. Um, as Susan mentioned, President Biden campaigned uh, pretty strongly on climate change. And in his first days in office, he stood in stark contrast to his predecessor, President Trump. He, by taking some, some strong action, he named an international and a national climate czar. He uh, rejected the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline, which would have transported oil from Canada to the U.S. He rejoined the Paris Agreement on day one of his administration, as he had long promised. Um, and he did sign into law in November a trillion dollar infrastructure bill that included money for clean energy research and resilience for communities. But also, as Susan mentioned, there have been a lot of roadblocks since then. The Build Back Better law, the Build Back Better bill, which included, you know, his marquee climate policy has been stalled in Congress. And it's unclear if that's going to change with the midterms coming up. So we're going to dive into all of this and a lot more where the action is, where it's stalled with our panelists. And I just want to start off by throwing it to you, Gina, um, as our Department of Energy representative here. Um, what are the successes so far, maybe, what, 14, 15 mon months into the Biden administration? Where has movement been made at the national government level on climate action? Great. Thanks, Carolyn. And first, let me say thank you to you and to the rest of the hosts and sponsors of this event. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Um, so as everyone knows, President Biden has really made climate change a one of the top priorities of the administration. So, you know, returning to the Paris Accords on day one, literally, you know, setting some pretty strong goals by 2030, cutting emissions in half. Uh, also by 2030, all light duty vehicle sales um, or half being electric by that date. By 2035, emission free power sector. And by no later than 2050, um, you know, full net zero economy wide at COP26 last year, which I think we'll hear more about from one of my fellow panelists, um, President Biden announced um, the country's long term strategy, which details the pathway to get to net zero. The president has announced dozens of executive orders on everything from mandating that the federal fleet will be electric to ensuring that 40% of all environmental funds will be designated to disadvantaged communities to orders around made in America and you know, high labor standards uh, for unionization and these clean energy jobs. Last month, um, the Department of Energy released the first ever US government plan to secure our domestic energy supply chain and industrial base. Um, and this was really a BFD. This means figuring out how to manufacture solar panels and wind turbines and you know, electric vehicle batteries um, all here right in America. So that's gonna help us fight climate change and at the same time really become the clean energy economic superpower that we need to become. Um, um, but I'm happy to say that the administration is really doing more than just uh, coming up with grand plans and setting goals, but really taking some action too. So I'll just give a few examples. So reinstating the clean car standards uh, that are near and dear to my heart as a longtime transportation advocate um, that are going to ensure that our cars are cleaner, they cost less to fuel, reinstating the authority of California and the other um, states like Massachusetts that can enact their own stronger clean car standards. Coming soon, new clean truck standards, which will be very important. Um, and then of course, as was mentioned, the bipartisan infrastructure law, really a historic step in the fight against climate change. $62 billion for the Department of Energy to spend on clean energy, things like making our infrastructure more resilient, $50 billion for that, modernizing the grid, $16 billion for that, historic investments in rail and public transit, tens of billions of dollars over the next five years, national network of EV charging stations, um, legacy 
uh, pollution and environmental re remediation um, being a priority to really finally address decades of environmental injustice in communities that have been disproportionately hit. Uh, Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, $20 billion for these cut, cutting edge technologies um, and $6 billion to fund domestic battery materials processing, manufacturing and recycling programs. Um, so I'll, I'll end that little um, uh, soapbox list there by saying that, you know, I'll, I'll state the obvious, which is that even with these billions of dollars and these grand plans, it's not enough, right? We, we really need to throw everything at the climate catastrophe. Um, so we have to do more. And I know that uh, there's a lot of talk about the Build Back Better plan. Someone earlier said it's dead. I would argue it's not dead. Um, those of us in the Department of Energy at least have a lot of optimism that you know we still have um, a great opportunity to pass some of these strong clean energy packages that have been discussed. So with that, I'll turn it to my fellow colleagues. Thank you, Gina. Um, for the flip side of the coin here, we're going to turn to Brad and talk about the sort of most important things that have not yet been accomplished in the Biden administration. The Build Back Better bill, as Gina has said, is not dead, but its fate is uncertain. Um, and that was the biggest way that President Biden was going to get to those climate targets that you also mentioned. So those emissions reduction targets by 2030 and 2050. So, Brad, what are the big missing pieces of the puzzle here that, you know, we're still, um, you know, we're still waiting on? You know, the, the failure so far to get Build Back Better across the finish line, which included tax credits and rebates to shift people to cleaner energy, cleaner cars, uh, investments in reducing emissions from agriculture, which are very significant. Uh, that is a, a, a probably the signature failure so far, but the glass ha is half empty in a lot of other ways in terms of things that have not yet been done. Uh, and I, you know, obviously, in dealing with Congress, uh, the linchpin has been Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia. Uh, it shouldn't have been a surprise that with this, the Senate divided 50-50 that the Senator from West Virginia who, who actually has family interests in coal would, would not be uh, playing ball on climate proposals. And uh, so it's, it's been not surprising that that's been uh, an uphill battle for the Biden administration. What's been more surprising is, are some of the things that have happened uh, within the authority of the, uh, of the executive branch that have either been slow in coming or have been stopped. Uh, you know, the very uh, aggressive initial signal on reining in oil, uh, oil and gas leasing on federal lands uh, pretty much uh, stopped, uh, partly by a court decision, partly uh, as a matter of, of just um, responding to that decision. A massive investment by the post office in new vehicles that'll, that'll bind the post office to uh, internal combustion en en engines essentially for decades. Uh, Biden administration unable to get the post office, which has uh, independent status, uh, to really rethink that procurement. Uh, similarly, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, one of the biggest energy players uh, in the federal government also has, uh, has independent status, uh, making a more than $3 billion investment in new natural gas plants. Again, locking us into fossil fuels for, uh, for decades to come. Uh, some other significant losses, one of them very recent, uh, was the, the failure of the nomination of Sarah Bloom Raskin to, as the vice chair of the Federal Reserve Board. Significant, we don't usually think of the, the Federal Reserve Board as, as a place for climate policy, but uh, one of the primary reasons she was, was lost that, uh, or was lost any support in the Senate uh, was because she thought uh, that climate risk was something that banks, uh, that the Fed should take into account in appraising uh, the risks that the banking system faces. And, and it was, so that really, um, it was a, it wasn't necessarily in the climate policy realm, but it clearly is going to affect uh, climate policy going forward. Uh, there are also, it's also curious that the administration has been relatively slow uh, to use EPA's authority. Uh, 
right at, at the bat, off the bat, the, admit, uh, the president promised new standards for uh, mercury for power plants. Uh, not a climate rule per se, but uh, by more tightly uh, regulating uh, coal-fired power plants, uh, those rules would, uh, would essentially accelerate the retirement of uh, the dirtiest and most climate damaging uh, uh, elect electric generating stations. And so uh, ac across the board, uh, there's, there's really been a, a slowness to the agenda in terms of moving forward. And, and as, uh, as, as Susan mentioned at the top of the hour, uh, the administration is now in a position where the Supreme Court has ac accepted a case uh, which is essentially going to call into question uh, whether EPA can regulate uh, climate damaging emissions at all. Uh, it's as recently as it was in 2007 that the Supreme Court in a, in a very strong opinion said, yes, uh, EPA has that authority. In fact, EPA has an obligation to regulate climate damaging emissions. Uh, it appears uh, and, and, and certainly is likely given the current composition of the court uh, that that uh, holding is in peril and will further constrict the options available to the administration uh, going forward in terms of using EPA's authority. Uh, doesn't put an end to the things EPA can do to act on climate, uh, but it will certainly limit uh, what it can do and uh, anything it does proceed with is, is obviously going to be very closely scrutinized by the Supreme Court and, uh, and uh, likely uh, subject to uh, either limiting or, uh, or, or otherwise um, divesting the EPA of its authority in the climate realm. As a result of that, much of the focus now has turned to what states are doing. In fact, in, uh, at the uh, climate summit in Glasgow, and in the run-up to it, President Biden made clear that his plan B, as the administration called, or the White House called it, uh, was really to uh, turn to the states to use their authority uh, to supplement what the federal government is doing uh, to make up for uh, the dysfunction in Congress on climate. Uh, and really start to move us toward a clean energy economy. And, and there's good news to report there. Uh, four more states enacted strong climate laws setting enforceable uh, climate reduction uh, mandates uh, just during the course of the pandemic. And I think what you're gonna begin to see is many of the things that uh, Gina laid out at the beginning in terms of those early victories on climate in the Biden administration uh, are going to be uh, followed by strong action from the, um, among the states, uh, or at least among uh, the more progressive states, demonstrating how, uh, how they can tackle the kind of nuts and bolts of uh, decarbonization, defining some of the rules that'll accelerate that process, uh, and really uh, leading the country in, uh, in terms of demonstrating how we're going to uh, decarbonize our energy system while uh, creating jobs and a new prosperity for the country. Thank you for that, Brad. It's interesting, during the Trump administration, there was a lot of talk about what cities and states were doing with the lack of national leadership. And now we're kind of in the same, the same boat, even though the administration has a very different um, party line on climate action. So interesting. Um, and next, I wanted to turn to Ed, who is one of the authors of the most recent IPCC report that focused on adaptation. Um, and in that report, there was a focus on what uh, could be done at a very different level, which is the community level. So we talked national level, we talked state levels, talking community levels. Um, Ed, I was wondering if you could give us some of the highlights about the importance of action at that level, and then uh, any other highlights you think are vital from, from that report. Sure, thank you. Um, I think where we'd start is thinking about what levels matter. I don't wanna dismiss any of the structural constraints or issues that have been raised by the panelists before me. They're really, really important, right? When you operate in a global capitalist system, you can't ignore the global capitalist system. If you open in a federal regulatory framework, you can't ignore that framework. However, 
Uh, one of the things that this report that we just finished, this was the working group two contribution to the IPCC. One of the things that we emphasized is something we call climate resilient development. Um, for the first time, uh, the last special report of the IPCC, the 1.5 degrees of warming report brought up this idea of climate resilient development. We amplified it in this report. Climate resilient development is really an effort to align adaptation, mitigation, and the achievement of development goals. This is harder than it sounds. It is not obvious that you will do this. And these three arenas have often worked in parallel in the past. And so you do something great for mitigation, but actually do harm to adaptation options. And there were all kinds of trade-offs that were happening. We spent a lot of time and effort thinking about how to bring these together. And that then takes me to the point that Carolyn was raising in her question, which is at what scale? Well, both adaptation and mitigation are in the end local questions because the impacts of climate change are actually highly local. How they're felt is local and actually diverse even within say small communities. And therefore the solutions you're going to pick are, need to be locally appropriate. You're dealing with different ecologies, you're dealing with different societies, you're dealing with different economies. And as a result, you cannot impose one set of solutions anywhere in the world in a broad kind of way and expect them to work. What really we need to do is find ways to create enabling frameworks for different localities, probably at the scale of the watershed at the largest, to work on how to integrate these things productively. That means that the local has an enormous opportunity here to do uh, good things for the climate. However, one of the things we also called out in this report for the first time in an IPCC report was the importance of diversity and equity and inclusion and even environmental justice in achieving climate goals. Bluntly put, what you define as a problem depends on who is at the table. And the climate change community, frankly, has not done as good a job as it needed to to bring as wide a community as it could to that table. So we have not necessarily defined the widest set of possible problems that are out there that need to be addressed. And then we go about looking for solutions. Again, we do not necessarily have the right people in the room. So the question is who benefits from these solutions and who experiences the trade-offs? And then we get into questions of whose jobs, you know, whose jobs are created, whose jobs are lost. All of this kind of thing starts to come into play. So we really emphasize the need to be thinking about issues of justice and equity and diversity if we're going to identify the climate challenges that are out there and if then we're going to find appropriate solutions. Finally, this is really important because one of the things we said in this report, and again, this is a first in our report, we are past the point of incremental change getting us to a climate resilient future. There are no small tweaks around the edges anymore that get us to where we want to be. We're talking about transformational changes to the systems in which we live everywhere. That is the food we eat, the way we move ourselves around the world, the way we generate and use energy, all of that is now up for grabs in a lot of ways. Thinking about how we're going to do that, again, depends on who's in the room and who's going to benefit and lose from all that. So those become incredibly important questions. Transformation inherently invokes issues of politics here. The fact is climate change is a people problem, really. It's not a technology problem anymore. We have the technology we need to adapt to climate change right now. We have the technology we need to mitigate climate change right now. We're choosing not to do it. That's our biggest challenge at this point. So thinking transformationally is really bringing that to the fore and bringing that people problem to the fore. I think the last thing I would say though, is we're not in a position when we talk about politics to talk about transforming or not transforming. That isn't how this is going to go anymore. The choice now is between the transformations we choose, the transformations we might manage to go in directions we want to go, and being transformed by an environment that we've had an effect on for over a hundred years. That means being reactive, inefficient, and probably ineffective. Those are the choices that are in front of us right now. And really, again, working at the local level, we have ways to think about solutions to adapt and to mitigate that really can bring those local communities forward. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that solutions developed at that level do aggregate up at larger scales to address the global challenge that is climate change. And, and just to jump in on Ed's point a little bit, uh, one of the really exciting developments uh, is the number of local leaders, particularly mayors here, here in Boston, we have a, a mayor committed to, the new, uh, to a new green de deal, Michelle Wu. Uh, and those leaders 
understand that uh, communities of color, communities of low income are hit first and worst by climate, uh, as Ed pointed out. And they're also in the best position to find the solutions that'll address those very serious issues of climate justice. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Ed. Um, when we talk about you know, the, the status quo no longer being an option, or we can't go back to how things were 10, 15 years ago when it comes to climate change, transformation is going to happen whether we, um, we make it happen or whether it happens to us. Um, those are some, some scary thoughts for you know, a species that is sometimes not that great at change. Um, and that's what your research, Sarah, gets to at least part of it. Um, and so I was hoping you could talk about eco-anxiety and what you've been finding about how climate change is impacting you know, the mental health well-being um, of folks, especially young people. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, I think as probably will surprise nobody here, um, young people are feeling scared. Research consistently shows that young people have higher levels of concern about climate change and higher levels of climate change anxiety or eco-anxiety, which we tend to define as cognitive, emotional, and behavioral responses to concerns about climate change. Um, and young people are understandably well aware that they're going to bear the bulk of the consequences of what we do or don't do right now. Just to share a little bit of data, um, a recent global survey of 10,000 young people from 10 countries showed approximately three quarters say the future is frightening. More than half agreed with the statement humanity is doomed. And more than a third say they're hesitant to have children because of climate change. So they're feeling really scared. Um, and many of them are angry too. And a lot of that anger is directed at governments. Um, in the same global survey, approximately two thirds of young people reported that the government was failing young people and more than half agreed with the statement, the government is betraying me in future generations. So we have a lot of young people who are feeling anxious, angry and betrayed when it comes to climate change. Um, and I think really a major question for all of us is to what extent will these feelings translate into activism versus paralysis um, or despair? Um, one encouraging study I just completed with some colleagues provides some initial evidence that, in, um, that suggests that engaging in climate activism may actually buffer the effects of climate change anxiety on mental health. So we know generally um, young people or people in general who are experiencing higher levels of climate anxiety also are more likely to experience higher levels of psychiatric symptoms like um, generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder. But what we actually saw is that for, if you're feeling high levels of climate anxiety and you're also engaging in climate activism, that then we don't see that same association with depression. Um, and so, so we see this kind of protective effect. And interestingly, we don't see that protective effect for engaging in individual action to address climate change, like recycling or conserving energy or reducing carbon footprints, but it's really about that collective action um, and activism. So we have huge numbers of young people who are reporting climate change anxiety and want to see governments doing more to address climate change. And we have some research suggesting that engaging in activism could be a helpful way to channel climate change anxiety and maybe reduce its impacts on mental health um, for young people. Um, at the same time, we know that there are far more people concerned about climate change than those actually engaging in efforts to address it, particularly political action and collective efforts. Um, we saw this both in our own research, um, the Yale Climate Communication Office has done a lot of work on this. Um, and while this kind of gap between concern and anxiety and action is disappointing, what it also means is there's really enormous potential for people to get involved in these efforts. Um, and I will also wanna mention, um, I know Ed brought this up that while research consistently shows that people of color, low income populations and women in the United States, re States report higher levels of concern about climate change, up until recently, they've, their voices and efforts have really been pushed to the margins when it comes to politics and even mainstream environmental movements. Um, so again, this is untapped potential and policies, as Ed mentioned, that don't reflect the interests of the most vulnerable. Um, that said, I think one of the most encouraging developments is that young climate activists are embracing um, climate justice and the idea that we can't think about the climate movement without thinking about racial justice and social justice. Um, and I, I don't know, maybe Ed can confirm this one way or the other, but my guess is that a lot of 
it, the voices of young people is what pushed this agenda into the IPCC report for the first time. Um, so those activist movements, I think, really are making a difference. Um, so I guess just wrapping up um, for the moment, I mean, we have a lot of young people who care about this issue and some amazing work happening, especially at the grassroots level, but we do continue to have this gap between people who care about climate change and those engaging in action, particularly political action. Um, in work that I've done more broadly on youth community organizing, we talk about the idea of opportunity structure, which basically means that if there's a structure or organization or network of people that youth can tap into, this matters just as much, if not more so, um, than if they really care about an issue for whether they actually will engage in activism or youth community organizing. So I think it's eminently clear that young people care about this issue. And I think the question remains to what extent organizers will really be able to provide an opportunity structure that leverages this deep anxiety and anger into effective political action. Thank you, Sarah. There, we have a couple of... Um viewer questions on this topic and on your research that I wanted to throw to you before we turn to the student questions that we have. Um, one of them, let me just find it again, um, was about the long-term impact of these anxieties in younger generations and their response to climate change. You kind of got through this a little bit, but I was wondering if you wanted to expand on it. Do you expect to see more or less engagement from youths about this issue because of these anxieties? Um, so, you know, longer term, um, how will these anxieties impact the younger generation? And then we had another question that was, um, that was um, kind of along similar lines was how, that was kind of about how do you, how do you um, make sure that these anxieties don't push people toward negative, um, uh, negative actions like being pushed into white nationalism or eco-fascism is this question, um, you know, harnessed, harnessing eco-anxiety for maybe a positive impact rather than one that pits people against each other. Do you have any thoughts on either of those, those questions from our viewers? Yeah, well, I think, I think for the first one for kind of long-term consequences, I think we, we don't know very much because this is pretty new. And I mean, I should mention, you know, psychology or clinical psychology in particular has not paid attention to this issue for too long. And I think only recently um, is kind of seeing the, the place of um, clinical psychologists in this field. Um, and um, that said, we are seeing you know, higher and higher levels of eco-anxiety among young people. Um, and again, I think one of the discussions in the field is, you know, we wanna make sure not to pathologize this because it is an appropriate and normal reaction to our environment. Um, and for some young people, it also overlaps with, um, with psychiatric illness and we wanna make sure that they're getting support as well. And so there is now an emerging field of ecotherapy to address these concerns. Um, and um, I think to the other question about um, ecofascism, the, the kind of negative sides of these, I mean, I think what, what is interesting is some psychology research, which is really focused on how to get folks motivated around, um, around engaging for climate change shows that while liberals are more likely to feel motivated by narratives around harm to harm to people, harm to animals, um, that um, conservatives are more likely to be motivated by kind of narratives around the purity of nature, which I think can turn into some dangerous narratives. Um, that said, um, so I, th I think we do wanna be careful in the let's make sure to kind of motivate everyone we can into, um, into this movement that we're not, we're not sacrificing you know, other, other important values. Um, that said, again, I, I have been incredibly encouraged by what the young climate activists, the, the work they're doing and the narratives they're telling, which again, are, are really making climate justice inseparable from racial justice and social justice. Thanks, Sarah. And we'll get to hopefully get to a couple more of those viewer questions after the student questions, if we have time before the end of our hour here. But I did want to call on the students we have with us to ask questions. So um, I'll call on you and you can um, uh, turn your cameras on, I guess, and ask your questions. So we'll start with, um, let's see, Sarah, I see your cameras up. We can ask you first. What's your question? Hi, um, I first just wanted to thank everyone for being here. I've really enjoyed the discussion so far. Um, my question is for Sarah um, regarding the anxiety that you just touched on. I really enjoyed your work 
And I love the idea of turning negative feelings into positive action. Um, but as you offered collective action as a solution to this anxiety, it seems that um, this could suggest that maybe um, it's coming from a source which is an innate human reaction to being out of control, especially where our own well-being is concerned. Um, the change we can attribute to our collective action, um, it will have a marginal impact at best, and really our fate will always rest on the actions of others. In that case, should we instead shift some focus to coping with um, the inevitable uncertainty of the future? That's such a great question. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think that there there's more and more discussion among activists about um, the need for both and, right, that we can't keep doing this work unless we're also paying attention to the feelings and making space for the grief. Um, and that um, there, there's some research that shows that um, from not from climate activism, but other fields of activism that engaging in activism and then having your goals not met can actually have, you know, make have a more negative impact on mental health, unsurprisingly. Um, so I think that the there the care for activists, um, there, there actually are um, different therapists and clinical psychologists developing um, support specifically for those engaged in activism because it takes a lot out of you. Um, that said, again, I think our, our research does suggest that it also gives a lot back. And I think particularly the social support, and there's qualitative research also to support this, where activists will talk about this feeling of feeling less alone. And particularly when there is space to process the feelings alongside engaging in action, um, that, it, that it can be a therapeutic process. Thanks for both of the Sarahs. Um, let's go next to Candy, your question. Thank you all for being here today. My name is Candy and I'm from Brockton, Massachusetts. And my question is for Brad Campbell. During the litigation on behalf of the low-income communities to find a remedy for the contamination of local water and the proceedings arising from ca catastrophic oil and chemical spills. I am curious, on behalf of the low-income communities, what was the most difficult thing you had to say no to or go against during the litigation? Um, you know, I think probably the most difficult aspect of that litigation is just the unequal playing field we're on in terms of the incredible resources that companies like ExxonMobil or Shell can spend, not just uh, on lawyers in the litigation, but also on deceiving the public as to climate science. It's very much like the, uh, the, the fight uh, against big tobacco uh, and their efforts essentially to uh, undermine climate science and, and delay any kind of uh, regulatory action. And I think overcoming uh, the, that kind of disinformation uh, is, uh, is, is a really uh, in, incredible barrier. Um, and uh, I think that uh, one of the most uh, difficult things in terms of working with communities, typically when we uh, bring a case. We are we have uh, we are doing it really in partnership uh, with uh, communities that are really on the front lines of being exposed to whether it's dirty water or uh, or potentially catastrophic risk, uh, as in uh, major uh, oil and chemical terminals that are uh, right in the heart of densely populated communities. Um, I think that uh, the the really tough aspect of that is just how long uh, that process can take uh, and how hard fought those battles are, uh, especially when uh, the gov 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 government isn't doing its job to enforce the law. Uh, people don't have the sense, um, people assume EPA, the state agencies, that they're, uh, they're sort of the cop on the beat, but too often, as you saw in places like Flint, Michigan, uh, the EPA is either turning a blind eye or just doesn't have the staff uh, to really address, uh, give uh, communities and particularly communities of color and low income, uh, give them the, the protection of the law to which they should be entitled. And that's where uh, 
uh, environmental advocacy groups really have to step in and, and fill that gap and enforce the law uh, where federal and state agencies aren't and low income and minority communities are being, being hit uh, the hardest by uh, both climate change and uh, pollution. Thank you, Brad and Candy. Um, next, um, let's go to Matthias. What's your question? Hi, hey, thank you to all the panelists for being here today. Uh, my uh, question is for Ed. Um, and building off of the topic of climate action at local levels, which has been discussed uh, during this discussion, um, much of your research in the past has focused on the development of agrarian communities in low income areas of the world. The global agricultural sector itself has become increasingly top heavy in the past few decades with large landowners and transnational agribusinesses either absorbing or bankrupting smaller operations. Do you think this trend is a serious threat to the livelihoods of climate of uh, people in these low income agrarian communities and uh, a serious threat to the development of climate resistant uh, communities themselves who will be uniquely vulnerable to the effects of climate change? Uh, that's a really good and really complicated question. Um, so, on one hand, the global food system is without question becoming more consolidated over time as you described. At the same time, 85% of the farms in the world are smallholder. That is to say two-ish hectares or less, and usually farmed in a, at least a semi-subsistence mode, um, though often producing some degree of surplus that gets marketed. Um, most of these farm communities exist at uh, both spatially and sort of conceptually at the edges of the global food system. So they're producing and they're not isolated. It's just that they're not, for example, producing to sell out into that system. However, their production affects local markets, which affects national markets. And of course, national markets determine how much surplus is available to be shipped to other parts of the world, that sort of thing. And vice versa, therefore, if there are shortages in other parts of the world, you can see price spikes and price increases radiate through our incredibly tightly interlinked global food system and show up in really unpredictable ways all over the world. Um, and we've seen this happen several times in the last couple of decades, where we end up with food price spikes in countries that are having perfectly adequate harvests because of food problems somewhere else in the world and how those prices were transmitted through that food system. So, are farmers themselves being directly challenged, at least in the places I do my work, which is mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa and in West Africa? Consolidation has been something people have been talking about in that part of the world for two, three decades. It hasn't happened. It just hasn't happened yet. And it doesn't appear that it's going to threaten those farmers directly. However, it is going to threaten them indirectly in the way I described. And when you end up with a deeply, tightly interlinked global food system like this, it becomes vulnerable to shocks from climate change, climate extremes, climate variability that we see that then do create real challenges for these communities on the ground because they don't really have the ability to control those markets or even shape those markets. A smallholder farmer simply doesn't have enough purchasing power to move that kind of thing around the way an agribusiness does. So they find themselves responding to and reacting to um, these sorts of challenges. All that said, uh, I now have 25 years of working in agrarian communities in sub-Saharan Africa. And if there's one thing I can tell you, do not underestimate a farmer. Do not underestimate these folks. They have been operating with limited resources, limited information, and frankly, limited power, usually in their economies and political systems for their entire existence. And they find ways to manage all of it. It's unbelievably impressive. That's really what I've actually spent my career trying to figure out is how they do this. Because if you really look at the things they're up against, it shouldn't happen. But farmers do find a way. I don't want to suggest and, and sound Pollyannish about this and suggest farmers are going to be just fine no matter what. I just am suggesting that we need to spend a lot of time really understanding the challenges and threats that folks face, not the ones we assume they might face, and then working to address those real challenges that are out there. 
Because in the end, if 85% of the farms in the world are smallholder farmers and things go really bad for a lot of those smallholder farmers, it is going to come back and affect us, again, in indirect ways, but in real ways. Really interesting. Thank you for that question and answer. Um, let's go next to Haley. What is your question? Thank you, Carolyn. And thank you to all the panelists for being here tonight. I have a two-part question for Gina. Because you are a strong supporter of switching to electric vehicles for climate protection, I wanted to ask you how policymakers can entice people to make the sustainable switch to electric without causing the public to feel as if their personal liberty of choice is being jeopardized. And as a follow-up, because your roots are in Boston, I wanted to ask you how realistic their goal is to be carbon neutral by 2050. Great, thank you for that question, Haley. It looks like you read my bio, <laughs> you did your homework. Um, great, well, so on the, um, maybe I'll start with the Boston one, even though I am based in the Boston area, I'm much less familiar with Boston politics and the Boston arena. Um, so I'm actually not sure how to answer that question, but I've been really excited to see how Mayor Wu and her administration have started to address issues of climate change. Um, so I'm hopeful on that front. On your first question, um, yes, definitely come from a background on electric vehicles and clean transportation. And as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot to be excited about on that front in terms of um, the change that this administration is working to achieve, um, but lots further to go. Um, on your question about kind of finding that balance between what government can do, but also ensuring that you know people have choice in the matter, it's a great question. So I'll say a few things. So one is we need regulations um, that will ensure that they're um, pulling the right levers. So for example, if it were just up to the auto companies, um, to just do the right thing and make cars more fuel efficient or transition to electric, probably not gonna do it um, as fast as we need them to do it, um, to avert the worst of climate change. In fact, they're definitely not going to. And so we definitely need government to put regulations in place that are gonna make cars and trucks cleaner, more efficient and transition to electric. Um, so we need that through the fuel economy standards, the GHG standards, and eventually some sort of standards that will um, require cars to go electric, but that's not gonna happen overnight. And so in the meantime, we need to make sure that electric vehicles are affordable and convenient. So the affordability piece comes through a few ways, You know, partly it's through economies of scale. So the more automakers are required to do this, the more they'll manufacture and the prices will come down. We've already seen the prices of batteries come way down. Um, and so that's exciting. Um, we're also seeing a lot more used electric vehicles on the market. I myself have bought used electric vehicles that are much cheaper than a lot of people would imagine. Um, and then we need to make them more convenient. So that means more charging stations in more places. So along highway routes, so people can feel comfortable taking long trips and charge their cars along the way. Also for people who don't necessarily have a garage or a driveway um, and have access to their own charging station, we need to make sure that charging stations are accessible at apartment complexes and at shopping malls and schools and you know, all sorts of other places where people are out and about. Um, and when we're talking about electric vehicles, we can't just be talking about personal vehicles. We also need to be talking about, um, for example, transit buses. Right, like transit buses travel through our communities every day and they're exposing us to diesel fumes, which are toxic and dangerous um, for our health and also for our climate. And so transitioning transit buses to electric is really important. And we've seen states like California say, we're gonna mandate all transit buses are gonna be electric and we need to see that from more states uh, and eventually from the federal government. Thank you for that answer and that question, Haley. Um, last student question goes to you, Kylie. You're the last woman standing. Hi, um, I'm Kylie. Thank you to, for everyone for being here. My question is actually for you, Carolyn. In your career as a journalist, what have you learned about climate change? And has there been any climate change effects that have been particularly alarming? If so, what was it and why? <clears throat> 
Um, in my career as a journalist, I've learned everything that I know about climate change because I learned on the job. So <laughs> um, it's been very interesting. I've covered climate change for about a decade and how we talk about it, who's talking about it has changed a lot. Um, the recognition, um, yeah, I haven't been working on this as long as I imagine most of the other panelists have been, but um, the amount of recognition is getting the amount of money that's going to climate solutions in the private sector um, feels like it's really changing. And um, the profile that the issue has, um, has really changed. So those are all things that have changed in a way that is heartening in the decade or so that I've covered climate change. Um, what is not heartening is that um, it's been 30 plus years since the scientist Jim Hansen testified in front of Congress saying we need to fix this climate change thing. And uh, every year since then, global greenhouse gas emissions have risen. So some things have changed um, and the trajectories are now starting to change due to the Paris Agreement and targets that, that were set there. But um, what hasn't changed is is that we haven't actually started bending the emissions curve down quite yet. So um, I think what I've learned is that there've been some positive changes, but it have, they haven't, as other folks have said, they have not moved at the speed at which we need to move them, them to move at. Um, I think the headline for the last story that I produced out of the um, Glasgow Climate Summit was incremental changes were made and transformational ones were needed or something like that. And that's kind of maybe what I've learned. <laughs> um, in terms of the sort of scariest things, I, I um, excuse the language, but as a climate reporter, I find that just about every day I have kind of an oh shit moment where I read a, a statistic or hear a personal story that um, really drives home how much this already is really impacting people. And um, how much worse it is likely to get, even if we do act faster than we're acting now. So it's just a, it's, it's kind of the death by paper cuts. It's not one um, big thing that's been really alarming. It's all the little things, um, you know, looking at the historical tide gauge data in, in the Southern US and seeing just how fast that's going up is one of those moments I've had recently. So, so yeah, thank you for your question. Um, we have just a couple, maybe about 10 minutes or so. Uh, thank you to all the students for your questions. Those were very well researched and will put many a professional journalist to shame. So <laughs> nice work. I am uh, looking forward to the days when you and the other students on this call are, um, you know, sitting in the positions of our panelists, because I think that's hopefully going to, to bring even faster action. Um, but I did want to get to a couple more audience questions um, before we wrap up this evening. Um, one of the questions was about nuclear. Um, what is the prospect of fourth generation nuclear as a key solution for climate change now that China has built the first fourth generation nuclear plant? It's a question from an audience member named Richard. Is there anyone who wants to take that question? I'll, I'll take that on. You know, okay. the, um, We've been hearing about fourth generation uh, nuclear for just about as long as I have been uh, in, a, in this career, uh, 30 years or so. Um, and it's, it's always uh, 10 years away and we still have the problems of waste and uh, that have not been, and safety that have not been resolved. There's no doubt that for uh, the foreseeable future, we're going to need the nuclear power plants that currently exist, at least the ones those that, those that can be run safely, uh, if we're going to bend the emissions curve. Uh, it's not clear that the public is going to accept a new uh, generation of, uh, of nuclear fission plants uh, if, uh, if the issues of waste and safety have not been resolved. Um, and it's also, I think, important to recognize that there are other technologies that are both on the shelf and uh, in the offing uh, from advanced geothermal to nuclear fusion energy, which has had major advances in just the last few years uh, that I think are more likely to be accepted by the public as 
uh, really transformational uh, zero emission technologies. Uh, I, you know, the a few years ago there was uh, really in the uh, during the Obama administration there was uh, you had the president supporting a, a nuclear renaissance, uh, bipartisan support funding. Uh, there were, I believe, three or four new nuclear plants that were started, uh, and uh, they essentially went into incredible cost overruns, uh, a lot of uh, objections from rate payers. They, they simply, that, that industry has simply not demonstrated its ability, uh, whether it's in, in the advanced nuclear reactors or in the more uh, traditional nuclear reactors to actually um, deliver a product uh, at the promised price uh, and address the issues of safety uh, that are critical to public acceptance. So I'm, I'm, I'd have to say that uh, I would urge people to look uh, at the new technologies that are horizon, on the horizon, as well as taking advantage of what we actually have, which are uh, you know, solar, wind, uh, storage technologies that are quickly advancing. Uh, there's, a, there's essentially a, a race on to see which state in the Northeast can, can get a, a their major offshore wind uh, platforms in the water uh, uh, first and uh, most. Uh, one of the things we, I think one of the successes of the Biden administration that we didn't even mention is the fact that they've really moved the permitting of offshore wind projects forward after four years in which the Trump administration was doing everything they could uh, to undermine renewable energy. Uh, and so, I think those solutions are really what we need to focus on. Uh, and to Carolyn's earlier point about investments by the private sector, uh, just, in the, just in the last 10 years, the, uh, the, the, the um, cost per watt of solar energy has gone down by more than two thirds. Uh, 20 years ago, nobody believed, nobody predicted that that kind of transformative change in, in that, uh, that um, energy source was anywhere in sight. Uh, but because there was investment, because those kind of incentives that the Biden administration has proposed, and because the private sector, both states and the private sector responded uh, to those incentives, uh, there's really a, a, a whole sea, sea change in uh, what people assumed about the energy future. And I think we're gonna continue to see that. And to the extent uh, we need moments of optimism, I think that history really does, uh, you know, I think reinforce the fact that we can, we have the potential, we have the technology, if only we have the will uh, to move the en energy transition along more quickly. If I, if I wanna, I wanna kind of jump in a little bit here because um, this really gets back to, in some ways, the, the framing of the question captures something that uh, I think Working Group 2 struggled against, even in its, the reporting that came out. Um, folks, we did not say we were doomed. That is something that kept coming out as headlines. And I have to tell you, folks, I did three weeks of media and every single bit of that, every interview, I said, please, please do not start with the doom headline. And everybody did anyway. Um, and I, I think it has to do with clicks more than perhaps content. But in any case, this has been tremendously challenging. When people start asking us, well, what about this technology or what about that technology? It presumes we don't have the technology. We have the technology. We have the technology to deal with this now. We know where the problems are. We know that land use is one of the biggest drivers. We could transform the way we do that. We could transform agriculture right now. I don't know how many people watching this realize we lose 40% of what is grown on this planet to waste, either not getting it to market, which is usually in the global south, or we throw it away, which is in places like here. We don't have a global food shortage. We're not vaguely close to a global food shortage. We're pounding the ground right now because we're incredibly inefficient with the way we use it. Same thing with trans transportation, same thing with energy. In the end, there are tons of transformative pathways out there. That was our message. Transformation is hope. 
There are so many ways forward here. There are so many solutions out there. And the fact that they have to be locally appropriate means there's so many levers to pull. And so when I hear about students getting anxious, and by the way, I have children of my own that exhibit this anxiety and it enrages me at times because they shouldn't feel this way. There are ways to engage them and get us into a world where we actually do things to move us forward as opposed to telling them you're screwed. And I feel like the message has been you're screwed. For My 15 year old has heard this her whole life. That's not correct. That's not the story. And I think we've got to find a way to pivot this narrative, because if we don't, we're going to have the same conversations over and over for 20 years, empowering the same actors that haven't gotten us anywhere in the first place. So I'm, you can tell I get a little fired up about this. This is where the scientist goes over here and the policy guy comes in. Um, but I really, really desperately want us to start thinking differently about this and not take on this challenge as one of doom and not think about transformation as a threat. It's hope. Thank you, Ed. Uh, at the risk of um, uh, ruining a lovely ending to the panel, um, <laughs> I did want to put one more listener, a viewer, audience question in before we uh, before we wrap up here. So we're a little bit over time, but I think this will be another good ending note. We have a question from Emen, um, which says, "What policy actions can constitute a quick wins to foster sustainable development and realize continuous improvement for human well-being?" So, I'm not sure there are any quick wins in the climate change space, um, but I'm wondering if we can do a quick lightning round. So, start thinking now. If there's like one low-hanging fruit um, in terms of climate policy that you think would actually be not that hard of a battle that would make a big difference. Um, you know, what is your wish list? What's your one, one, one thing that you think could really make a difference if it, it could happen? It could be that, you know, reducing food waste. It could be, you know, um, um, hiring more therapists or psychologists so that, uh, you know, the younger generation can channel their eco-anxieties toward productive manners, whatever it is. But maybe I'll give you uh, one more second to think about it. If you can give me your answer in one sentence or so. Um, I will stall for just a second so you can gather your thoughts and say thank you to the organizers of this event and all the fabulous students who asked questions and thank you to my fellow panelists. I'll hand this over to Christina when you guys are done um, to say the final word, but last final lightning round. We will go to from left to right on my screen. So we're gonna start with Ed. Wish list for climate quick fixes. Uh, absolutely. More funding to build capacity in the global south in the most challenged countries. Just more funding to get folks the training, education, research they need to come up with local solutions. That would be a tremendous win to pay incredible dividends. Thank you. And we'll go next to Brad. Well, I would echo the point made earlier about just the, just the amount of waste. Food waste is a big one. But I, I one thing we didn't touch on that I think is uh, really something that everybody can act on uh, locally and nationally, which is uh, the, the role that plastics play in climate change. We don't often talk about it, but the entire uh, business plan for the fossil fuel industry as we wean ourselves off of fossil fuels for transportation is to have a massive increase, which has already started in the use in single use plastics. Uh, which are made from fossil fuels, people don't think about it. But tackling that set of issues, uh, uh, you know, essentially taking away the social license of uh, the chemical and plastics industry, reducing uh, and, and, and regulating the products that, that, are, uh, that are being, the plastics are being used for uh, is something where there hasn't been enough action and where citizens can have a big, big impact. Got it. Thank you, Brad. And next to Gina. All right. Well, we definitely need Congress to step up and pass a clean energy package that's going to get it's going to make it much less expensive for businesses to invest in solar and wind and electric vehicles and much more affordable for consumers to invest in these kinds of technologies for their everyday lives, which is going to help our climate and it's also gonna help our pocketbook. So we need to pass it. And thank you for having me on this panel.
Last word to you, Sarah. Well, I would echo what all the panelists have already said um, and getting that, um, that package through Congress. Um, but I would say, you know, that we, we all can help get that package through con Congress, right? Like that there's so many people who care about this issue and are putting so much energy into feeling anxious about this issue and putting so much energy into some individual actions to reduce their carbon footprint. And if we could channel that into political action, I think we can move that forward. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to all the panelists. And I will hand it back over to Christina for the final word. This was an amazing conversation. And I have to tell you, it was really, really, really hard not to jump in and ask my own questions. So thank you all for being with us. One thing we didn't really get to is the fact that the IPCC report dropped at about the same time that Russia invaded Ukraine. And it has not gotten the attention or, as Ed has said, the, the spin <laughs> that the panel would have wished. So I hope this conversation has helped to highlight some of that. And I also loved the end call to action, right? Because this is something we all have to do. And it is not necessarily something that is going to be so costly that we can't get over that hump. So thank you all. Thank you, audience. Thank you, students who asked super questions. And I invite everyone to come back April 5th for our second to last episode in this series, which will be looking at one of Biden's four major initiatives, and that is his equity agenda. And we'll be asking exactly the same thing. How far has he come? How far does he have to go? And what does it have to do with midterms? So panelists, thank you for your time. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you.